Welcome, folks. Welcome. Welcome. Seeing your pictures come in. It's so delightful to see you. And as always, I'm going to welcome in the more than human world. And I'm wondering if you all, considering the time of year, um, might guess this one as easily as last month. Welcome reindeer. Did you know that reindeer's hooves change with the seasons? During the winter, their foot pads shrink and tighten so the hoof rim can cut into the ice and the snow for traction. In the summer, their foot pads become spongy so that they can travel across the soft tundra. And here's perhaps an even more amazing reindeer fact. Did you know? But according to researchers at the University College London, reindeer are the only mammals that can see ultraviolet light. I did not know that. Now we know. Reindeers are awe-inspiring far beyond their presence on holiday cards and decorations. Welcome to the Compassion Consortium Sunday Service. I am Reverend Sarah Bowen. I'm joined today, as always, by co-founders Victoria Moran and Reverend William Melton, as well as Phil and Elaine. To ensure that we don't have unwanted or disruptive guests, we have turned off some of the Zoom sharing functions, in case you're looking for them. We meet for Sunday service on the third Sunday of every month. If you're new to us, welcome. We are an interfaith, interspiritual, and interspecies community. Interfaith means we welcome people of any religion or spiritual path or system of meaning making, and we feature a diverse range. Today, we'll be talking with Dr. Claire Lindsay from the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics about animal theology in the Christian traditions. Interspiritual is a term coined by Brother Wayne Teasdale. It means that we believe underneath all of those worlds, religions, and spiritual philosophies and ways of meaning making, we can find commonalities particularly shared values of peace, compassionate service, and love for the earth community. So we do practices within our services to try and cultivate those values. Today, we have a snow-inspired meditation with plenty of winter animals for you. And finally, we are interspecies, which means that when we say earth community, we mean everyone, including reindeer and humans doing remarkable things to raise compassion for animals in the world. So today, during, during Compassion in Action segment, we'll hear from Miyoko Schenner, founder of a number of animal-free food companies and director of the Rancho Compassion Animal Sanctuary. At the beginning of each service, we draw our awareness to beings present in a specific habitat. So my husband, Sean, and I are packing today for our flight to Greece to visit my stepson and his wife who live there. And so I've been dreaming about glimpsing animals in that habitat, like the European pine marten, the Eurasian brown bear, the southern white-breasted hedgehog, or the endangered Mediterranean, Mediterranean monk seal. My stepson assures me I will see none of them. <laughs> However, it is more likely that I will be hanging out with 65 species of birds who actually live in Athens, where those other animals don't. Hopefully, I will see at least one Greek squirrel. Are you traveling this holiday season? Who might you see? Look them up. Find out about them. Find out about the animals and the habitats that you're traveling to. But amidst the glee that I feel about our upcoming travel, I simultaneously have a very heavy heart. A Christmas card that I received from the House of Grace Catholic Workers perhaps summed it up best. They wrote, Advent 2023 is a season of contradiction, of light and darkness, despair and hope. And looking around the world, it's not hard to see where this sentiment comes from. It can be hard to feel like being jolly when you're holding grief. I'm reticent to tell anyone, happy holidays! because I'm not sure what is going on in their life. How can I tell someone to be happy when I don't know the context? Especially when I'm not really feeling in a holiday mood myself this year. I didn't take out our many menorahs this year, nor did we put up any trees or decorations. And I cited too much work 
and I'm behind, and we're going out of the country for the holidays. Anyway, it will be decorated there as excuses. It makes me sad, though. I have a very awesomely unique manure collection. I have a tall, four-legged creature who stands with the candles on his back and the shamash in the middle of his forehead. I have a steel pink Cadillac menorah. I have a whale and I have a lion. And so usually I need a lot of candles. And every year these four menorah get lit and on the altar on our side table, I delight in the practice of prayer and of blessing and I spend a lot of time doing it. And this year they are all in the basement along with my dreidels, my Christmas ornaments, our festivist candles, and everything that I haul out of the basement to celebrate Bodhi Day, the birthday of Buddha. I just didn't feel like celebrating the holy days the way we usually observe them as an interfaith family every December. And then on the first night of Hanukkah, I was at the bake shop and I saw the most beautiful Star of David cookies. Vegan shortbread covered, just smothered in blue colored sugar. And so I bought them. I went home and I said the blessing, Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, and so forth, over the package and gave my husband a cookie and ate one myself. And then we sat down and watched TV. And the next night we did the same thing. On night five, I heard my recovering Catholic husband, that's how he describes himself, in the kitchen singing some odd collection of tones and holding a cookie. Our feline housemates were looking up at him as Sean tried to remember my words and said something along the lines of Baruch Ata Abadi Abado. And then he brought me a cookie. And I smiled and I was filled with so much joy. We might not be observing the kind of traditions we participate in each year, and you can probably hear in my voice how that makes me feel but we had found a new way to honor the holiday this year. Although I must confess, we ran out of cookies by night six. Luckily, I went there yesterday and got a whole nother package. Many people may find themselves making alterations in this season of contradiction, trying to find light in the darkness, or trying to bring hope where there's despair, or fear, estrangement, violence, exploitation, sadness, or loneliness. May all of our candles continue to burn bright with compassionate action and hope this season. Even if those candles happen to be made out of dough and are really, really, really yummy in your tummy. And as the new year of the Gregorian calendar comes around, may we recommit ourselves to the values of peace, compassionate service, and love for the entire Earth community. That's it for me. Over to you, William. Yes, I am unmuted correctly. Am I? Okay. All right. So this is the place where we always um, have a guest read our tenants of agreement, which you would find these also on our web in our um, web page. So today, our tenants of agreement will be read by Jody Jacobs. Jody is an ordained Compassion Consortium animal chaplain, a NYS licensed wildlife rehabilitator, an animal Reiki practitioner, a board member of farm of the free animal sanctuary and is the ambassador of the animal communication collective a group of animal communicators who host who host online events raising funds for animal rescues and sanctuaries around the world jody's goal is to help animals in any way she can you can check out some of the animal organizations close to her heart at the um, website that is added to the chat. So I think now we would like to ask um, Jody to read our tenants of a read of 
uh, uh, tenets of reading, tenets of agreement. Thank you. We acknowledge a divine force at the heart of the universe and in all living beings. We may refer to this force as God, but it is known by many names and appears in different forms or as formless. We recognize the common moral principles inherent within all wisdom traditions. We affirm that compassion, reverence for life, and nonviolence are fundamental to religious faith and moral philosophy and are to be extended to all sentient beings. We stand by the principles of inclusion, diversity, and equality, and hold these as essential in our human relations. We hold that non-human animals are imbued with the same essence of life and love as our human animals, and that there is moral parity between us. We avow that humans do not own the earth, its resources, or its inhabitants, but instead must be involved in their protection and care. We endeavor to eat and live in a kind and sustainable manner, moving away from animal foods and animal-derived clothing, as well as any activities that cause harm to our fellow beings, human or otherwise. We aim to provide spiritual comfort, fellowship, and food for thought to those practicing or exploring a vegan lifestyle. We offer guidance and peer support for all those seeking a more compassionate and spiritual life. We commit to sharing these principles freely with humility and respect in support of non-human animals and the earth. Jody, thank you so much. And you actually summoned Max in Claire's window. I just saw as you were speaking, this just dog snout come right across. So well done. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us what we're here for. Yeah. So today, as promised, we have a snow-based meditation with the more than human world. Uh, it was created by another one of our animal chaplains, Ellen Schmidt, who is an ordained interfaith, interspecies animal chaplain and a certified end-of-life doula. Her calling has included various roles in animal care uh, over 12 years at a large nonprofit animal shelter in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She's the founder of Quest Companion Dog Training, where she uses her knowledge of bond-centered animal plus human relationships to teach canine caregivers to communicate compassionately and effectively with their dogs. And as a chaplain, she specializes in helping animal caregivers through some of the hardest steps of their journeys, the movement towards death and our grief at their passing. Ellen is with us today on video. So Phil, if you could cue that up. And as you're doing that, I'm gonna invite folks with a, a little bit of direction here. As this video is playing to just uh, watch your breath, attend to it just slowly in and out and see what the world has to show us that sometimes we don't notice.
Take one more deep breath. For some of you, that seven and a half minutes might have felt like an eternity. We're not used to resting. We're not used to hearing that much natural silence usually or being quite that observant of our habitats. But what might the world open to us if we did? Research tells us that as activists and advocates, we need rest. We need rest. So if there's snow in your area and your feet are like a reindeer or you are on a sandy beach or you are in a grassy area or your feet hit pavement, hopefully you'll try this practice counting every other step for a count and then just stop. All of you in New York City, be careful if you stop, move towards a building, okay? Um, so someone doesn't run you over. But I hope this practice is helpful for you, helpful for your well-being. Hey, Victoria, you're up. Thank you so much, Reverend Sarah. And um, blessings on this season to everybody who's here. We have such a big group today. This is wonderful. And I can understand why we do, because we have a couple of stunning uh, holiday time guests. And I'm going to be speaking in our special spiritual guest segment with Claire Lindsay. She is a British theologian. And just think about that for a minute. How, how often do you actually meet one of those? She's also an ethicist and a writer. As Sarah said, she heads the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics. And she, among many, many other things, specializes in animal ethics, systematic theology, feminist theology, and Christian moral thought. Welcome so much, Claire Lindsay. Thank you so much, Victoria, and thank you, uh, thank you, Reverend Sarah, for having me. It's wonderful to be here, and and thank you for being up <laughs> late at night. I know it's uh, not our regular time um, for for your time zone. So I'm very interested. I'm sorry. I am very interested, Claire, in what it was like growing up as. Andrew Lindsay's daughter. Those of us who have been around a while, it's like Andrew Lindsay has always been here and he has always been for the animals. So tell us a little bit about that legacy piece. Um, well, I, 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 I can't tell you what it's like not to be his daughter. I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's probably quite unusual, I guess. And I, I didn't, I wasn't aware as a child how unusual it was. So he was chaplain to the Essex University when I was a child and I'm one of four um, and uh, we were surrounded by students and uh, people of all different faiths um, so I think it was fairly natural really that I would grow up to be a theologian though I am the only one of the four who did that um, but we were raised with the idea that um, God loved animals that God cares more um, for the rest of creation and um, it's just the basic tenet of how I see the world if you'd asked me when I was a child oh, what a Christian person was like I would have told you they were definitely a vegetarian um, you know probably left wing um, very compassionate um, and uh, you know thought more about um, other people and other beings um, than themselves so I will say there was a little disappointment when I got older and met and other people who consider themselves religious um so i think that that's um reconciling um, the lindsay worldview uh, with sometimes the less compassionate acts of other people who are christians is um is something i would say that um, i struggle with still um but i i think that grounding in the basic understanding that god loves the world and god cares about more than human beings um it's just foundational to how i see the world um i mean i will say um that it you know it has its challenges but it's it's also a blessing i mean working with him is um uh yeah i mean working with parents is has it has its moments um but uh it's it's never not interesting and uh it's a it's a cause i believe 
deeply in and uh, it's, it's wonderful to wake up and think that you might be hopefully doing some good in the world, spreading some compassion. So where did your father come upon these beliefs about animals? Certainly when he was starting out, it must have been quite unusual. It was quite unusual. Um, well, I think I should say that if you want a fuller answer to this, you should eventually watch the animal thing, the movie, which uh, we've just finished making. Um, but uh, the short, uh, the short version is that I think he grew up with yeah, people who ate meat, and he would tell you that he, when he was a very young child, he made the connection between, you know, what was on the plate and uh, you know uh, the chicken, the animal, and the chicken on the plate, and he was told a lie um, that you had to eat meat to survive. And he thought, I, I think that that's a basic moral instinct that a lot of children have, um, uh, that, that this is, that they don't want to eat animals, but actually that this is just what we have to do to survive. That this is just what happens. It's not very nice, but that's what it is. Um, and it wasn't until he met a vegetarian, until uh, he was 14, um, when he was 14, that he realized that actually he could live differently and he became vegetarian instantly. Um, that's also the time in which he found God and uh, decided to become a priest. Um, so, I, I mean, they come, for him, they come together. Those mm. ideas about uh, God and animals actually are very closely aligned, but I think um, it certainly was unusual and he would tell you that it has been a very unusual path he's walked, but not unprecedented. So many other religious people, many other Christian people thought deeply about animals. Um, he just wasn't surrounded by them. Um, but uh, nonetheless, um, uh, felt deeply um, that God cared for animals and that he could, that he could help persuade people that that this was how God the creator sees the world. Well, tell us about the movie. <laughs> yeah, sorry for the plug. Um, oh, I know we want to hear. <laughs> um, what well, it's, um, so Andrew had this idea that he would like to make a movie um, about his work. Um, and my uh, brother is a filmmaker. And so uh, we undertook to make um, a movie about uh, his life, his struggles for animals. It's a, he would say, an embarrassingly personal movie. Um, and uh, yeah, it's um, it's currently going to film festivals, and hopefully will premiere at one um, uh, over the winter. And it's uh, um, yeah, I, for those of you, I know there's some people in the audience who were at the summer school. It had its first private screening at our summer school this summer, and. Uh, yeah, it was um, a privilege to share it with people. Um, yeah, he would say it's too personal, but I think it's an important journey to chart. Um, and it just strikes, you know, like a lot of animal people, you know, we have struggles, the things we fought for. And uh, it's nice to be able to um, share those struggles because I think the best thing about the movie from my perspective is that I think it's uh, hopeful it's it's real in its struggles but i think it's also hopeful um and uh it shows what it takes to spend your life as i'm sure many of the people listening to this already know what it takes to give your life for animals to give your life for any cause really yes so tell us a little bit claire you used the word christian a few times and that word when i hear it at least here in the states just sounds different from the way it sounded when I was growing up as a Christian. So I'm just interested in what that means to you today in your work for animals and just how you see the world. Well, it's a hard question um, in, in many ways. It's actually not some, I am a Christian. I am um, Church of England. It's not something I, or Episcopalian, I think is your equivalent. It's not something I actually advertise a lot, to be honest. Um, though I am um, a member of Wycliffe Hall, which is a Christian theological community in Oxford. And um, I think it's, for me, professionally, um, and in terms of the work I'm doing, it's really, really important, the Christian focus, because 
so many ideas um, that people have about animals, that they're here for our use, uh, that we can do what we want with them, dominion, domination, are um, actually misconstrued Christian ideas that people have just taken up into their beliefs and thinks it's just part of their lives. So for me, it's very important to talk to a Christian community because um, I'm hoping to change that perspective. Um, and you've got to be in it um, to make a difference, I think. But it also applies beyond the Christian community because Christianity's it's influenced so much of the way we live our lives. Most people don't know that their ideas are Christian um, uh, or have a Christian basis. Um, but I, for me, spiritually, um, I'm, I, I, I do adopt a slightly more personal interfaith approach. I like meditation and yoga and um, I'm, I, I think I would be classed more like a nature mystic perhaps i think i i i believe god is um in in creation and i think the most uh the the greatest sense one has of god really is within god's creation and i think for me the very heart of it all which is why it matters to be a theist is the idea that humans are not god it's a very simple idea and yet so many people act as if the world is theirs to do what they want they assume godlike power and actually i think actually the the jesus message is one of moral inclusivity sorry my dog is making noise um he likes um <laughs> but it is what you see in jesus is the higher sacrificing themselves for the lower it's a deeply profound message especially in the time of climate change because i think it, if we are to get through the crises that the world is um throwing at us at the moment um in all kinds what we need is a commitment to peace um we need to commit to passion but also we have to have a sense that it might cost something it might actually cost more than we want to give up and for some people um giving up eating animals is it big thing and yet it is essential if we are to face the challenges ahead of us sorry that was a bit rambly wasn't it <laughs> no that was and I'm so glad that you you brought in the climate change one of the things we try to do here is make connections certainly there are people um, helping animals in different ways and and I'm working with a couple of people now on a panel and a medical doctor, a dietitian, and myself. And we're so excited because we're trying to get the ethical vegans and the health vegans to be in the same room <laughs> together <laughs> nicely. And, and I know this happens with environmentalists with how can we communicate with the animals at the center and do a better job of keeping ourselves out of it? Oh, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, I, I think the, it's an inherently, we, we see our worlds in, inherently from our own perspective. And I think that is the fundamental challenge of being human, to try and see beyond ourselves, to see beyond um, our own concerns, our own worries, the animal community. I'm sorry, I don't know what my dog's doing. Um, <laughs> but um, I feel, you know, for me, I think it all goes together. It, and that's why I always talk about peace, because I think it is about living non-violently and living non-violently is good for animals and it's good for humans. You know, we're trapped in cycles of violence that we need to escape. And whether you think that's for health reasons, because it, it's violence to your own body, or whether you think it's for public health reasons, because we're running out of antibiotics, or whether you just think that causing animals harms causes more harms to human beings all of which are true they're all systematically linked you see how you said it before i'm a systematic theologian it all goes together and i think and i think we have to use all the tools at our disposal um, to reach people where they are which is so, enormously difficult to do <laughs> yeah well tell us what a systematic theologian is and then if you could tie that in to the whole idea of there being an academic 
discipline around animal ethics. That's certainly not at every university. That's not a, a universal course of study. So uh, what's it like? Systematic and then tell us about animal ethics in an academic setting. Um, okay, uh, well, a uh, systematic theologian is a theologian who um, holds that all the I doctrines, all different ideas about God go together. So you you can't have an idea of God the creator without salvation. Um, the, they hold it all together. And for me, that's key to the moral theology because tell me what kind of God you believe in and I'll tell you your ethics. You know the the one flows from the other so it is about understanding the whole um when it comes to people's beliefs um and i think that's generally speaking a holistic approach um to life um is always a positive thing in terms of animal ethics so dad began as a theologian too so i'm a second generation animal theologian which is in itself quite funny um <laughs> but he saw beyond um his own discipline and saw that there was something really important about all the disciplines talking to each other so when i think of animal ethics it isn't just about philosophy it's not just about law it's you know it it, it really takes an approach which tries to get animals on the academic agenda throughout because we need it on the academic agenda throughout because it affects all of our different um disciplines doesn't matter if you're a scientist doesn't matter if you're you know a history a historian you know i know robin helaman's in the audience you know she does great work on animals and history and i think at all points in our lives you know we we don't do enough talking to each other and so the goal of my work really is to try and help build community try and help animal academics because they're often very marginalized and try and support their work um and just basically get more animals out there to be considered morally um, because it really does impact every aspect of our lives. Yeah. So what can you tell us, Claire, about what's going on for animals in the UK? I've always felt that you guys were several steps ahead and it's really fun to see what's happening there now. <laughs> I don't know if we are several steps ahead. Um, I sometimes I like to think that we're making some progress, but the reality is is that every every country in the world has is making some steps forward and some steps back, and that's a, you know, uh, for example, we just released a report on predator control, um, which I hope will eventually have impact beyond the UK. But the Scottish government is currently considering um, the practices that um, they allow to govern more land. Um, most of those practices are done so that they can shoot grouse. So they kill other animals so they can shoot the grouse. And it's, I mean, it's it's horrible. Um, trapping, uh, snaring, poisoning happens throughout the globe. Um, so we're really trying to get that on the agenda so they'll consider it. Um, but I think you you hit those same barriers that you do in the rest of the world. So for example, um, conservationists uh, seem to have the continual argument that we need to kill other animals so that other animals uh, can flourish, um, uh, which is appalling. Um, it's not all conservationists, some are compassionate, but it has been the dominant trend. Um, so that's that's a thing we're really focusing on the moment um, because I just think it's unnecessary and it's part of some outdated wisdom that needs to be challenged. Um, but grouse shooting is a practice of the elite um, and it comes with its own uh, institutional resistance. Um, but, you know, in other ways, we're making some steps forward. Um, but I think our current Conservative government is um, not as progressive as you would like. Hun uh, banning trophy hunting is going through the House of Lords at the moment. And uh, they pass through the House of Commons, but they're basically rejecting it in the Lords level and with all kinds of amendments, even though there's mm -hmm. wide public support for it. So, um, 
yeah, that wasn't as uplifting as I'd like that to be. Um, let me think if there's something good I can share. <laughs> well, I, I hear there is a summer school over there that is just worth saving up for. Well, that is something that is wonderful that happens every year. Um, yeah, we're going into our ninth year um, and uh, Reverend Sarah's um, from the last two years, I think, maybe three. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a really... It, it is a really wonderful and uplifting occasion and I a lot of people tell me they come mostly for rejuvenation and to restore them for the work ahead which is an amazing gift but basically it's um, 150 academics um, advocates around the world um, who come and uh, they talk on a different theme each year this year's theme is animal thinkers and we are celebrating the pioneers of ethical sensitivity to animals um and I, i'm sure there'll be some ones we know but the idea is that there are also many that we don't know i want to hear the un unheralded stories um we have a movement which seems to be filled with men at the top you know big names peace singer tom reagan and i would just love to hear about the women um and what they've done for animals and also just the, the people who are working on the ground um pioneering their thought in different disciplines um so yeah it is um yeah it, it is my favorite part of the year it's intense but it's it's definitely definitely worth coming for in, in my 50 years of this there were always lots and lots of women and there were a couple of guys at the top who always got quoted so in our very last minute, and I mean literally minute, this always goes so fast. It's almost Christmas. If Jesus were to come in 2023 and give a Christmas message, what would be at the heart of it? Um, I think what would be at the heart of it would be compassion and love and concern for the weakest among us um it is what my dad calls a paradigm of inclusive moral generosity and i think that's really what we need now you know it's that great joke you know if jesus came back now you know he'd be found in a gay bar and i think there's some truth to that you know it is it's at the margins and it's hard to argue that animals aren't the most marginal where thank you so so very much it's been absolutely delightful i know it's late if you can stay we'd love it if you can't we love you <laughs> and uh really really appreciate this merry christmas merry christmas thank you for having me thank you hi everyone today's guest on compassion and action we're honored to speak with the always amazing miyoko shinner she's the author of five vegan cookbooks a singer a writer, a chef, and founder of the Rancho Compassion Rescue, and always an ardent advocate for animals. She calls herself an Epicurean activist who is out to end cruelty to animals and climate change, as well as by connecting our palate to our future. Welcome, Miyoko, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Elaine. Hi, Victoria. Hello, everybody. Happy holidays. Can you tell us a bit about Rancho Compassion uh, Miyoko? What would li I'd like to know what moved you to create that rescue and why did you choose to rescue farmed animals? Well, I started Rancho Compassion uh, eight years ago here out. We're in West Marin in California. And um, initially it was because it happened by chance. A couple of goats arrived. Someone asked me to take some goats in and I did. And then someone said, well, there are these three little pigs that need saving. And then it just kind of went from there. Um, I don't, we don't really call ourselves a rescue. And in fact, our mission has sort of begun to splinter from the idea of just rescuing animals. I came to the realization last year or this year, actually, that there are billions of animals to be saved and there's no way that sanctuaries can save farmed animals. And I realized that the most effective way uh, to stop animal agriculture was to change hearts and minds. So we launched a, uh, an ed a youth education program. And currently we have about 50 kids a week coming to the sanctuary uh, to commune with animals, to understand that they are their friends, and then to get their hands in the soil in our new compassionate education garden. 
uh, to grow vegetables, to learn where their food comes from. And it is this entire cycle of learning about animals as individuals and a garden as a place to grow food and to connect with, with our food system, to learn that we can actually grow our food, that food does not come in a package from the store. Um, and I believe that if we can really embrace children and harness the powers that they have within themselves to understand compassion, because they do at a very young age, and we can empower them to understand that they can be actual uh, agents of their own food system, then we can really begin to tackle the problem ahead of us in creating the need to create a compassionate food system. Um, and so we really pivoted to education. And of course, we did just take in two more pigs from the La Haina fa uh, fires, two little piglets that were born the day after a fire ravaged uh, a pig farm. The mother pig, Mud Pie, went into the pond and saved herself. And the next day she gave birth to a litter of pigs. And uh, the farmer decided not to go back into farming. Um, and there were 45 pigs that needed rescuing. So we took two little piglets. Um, so yes, we, we will rescue once in a while when appropriate. Uh, but we are really focusing on uh, an education program that we are currently building um, we have students coming from all walks of life. We have students uh, from a school that deals with disabled and uh, kids on a spectrum. Um, we have school a school that deals with at risk youth. Mm -hmm. um, and so and we also have little elementary school kids coming and high schoolers. So we've got kids from sort of all backgrounds, all wa walks of life. And the idea is let's open up their hearts because they are, the generation that will lead the world tomorrow. Um, and so that's really what we're focusing on right now is away from rescue. We don't call it, we're a farmed animal sanctuary, but we've really pivoted. So we're not just a sanctuary for animals, we're a sanctuary for people where they also can find peace when they come here. I love that. And I agree, children are the future and they educating them while they're young is so terrifically important. On your website, uh, you mentioned there was a great line about people finding themselves at yes. the sanctuary as well. Can you talk a little bit more about that for adults as well? Yes, it's really interesting. Um, I am very critical and about uh, where philanthropy and animal rights is going today. It's going more away from animals and activism and more towards activism that, that creates uh, capitalism. I call it captivism. So I'm, uh, but one of the organizations that's really pushing for this, the Effective Altruists, actually did a study of 5,000 vegans and vegetarians. And they asked them, well, what were your initial reasons for transitioning away from animal foods? And the, the primary reason was personal conversations. But number two, and I believe number four, were animal interactions. And so connecting people with animals is a way for them to under, to discover their own compassion, to discover who they truly were before they were mm -hmm. indoctrinated in this capitalist society where we uh, we uh, we uh, numb people from the ability to love and to have compassion, um, where we honor success and monetary achievements over our ability to love others and to take care of others, uh, which includes animals as well. Um, and so I believe that is, this is a place, a sanctuary is a place where you can find yourself and you can find yourself when you open yourselves up to others. And others means not only a human community, but animals as well. I could listen to you talk all day. I mean, God, that's beautiful. I wanted to ask you one question. You have a long and ongoing history for doing so much good for animals and so much of it is broad reaching. Do you reach for causes like the one you've just been speaking of that have the broadest effect or do, do you just respond to issues that happen to come your way? Um, you know, it really depends. I mean, I am out there uh, promoting, for a long time, I really tried to solve the problem of animal agriculture through producing uh, vegan products, because I thought, okay, all we have to do is replace what's being sold and that will solve the problem. I don't believe that anymore. 
I believe the way we tackle animal agriculture and is ultimately changing ourselves. It is not about stopping a practice. We are on this earth to evolve as human beings and to discover our own humanity. That has been the same cause for thousands of years, whether you look at it from a Christian angle or a Buddhist angle, it doesn't matter. It is all about our own human evolution. How do we evolve into better, more compassionate human beings? And if we don't get back to that, to working on ourselves, nothing in the world will ever change. We will be the same place tomorrow as we were yesterday if we don't do as individuals the hard work. And I believe that the way we do that is by creating community, by creating safe places, sanctuaries, not just for animals, but for people, um, communities where we work together to work on ourselves and to work on the problems of the world. And we cannot do it alone. And we are forever evolving away from community. And we're, we, we are now living these sort of isolated individual lives where we're relating to our screens or our, our jobs or whatever. And we need to get back to the table. We need to get back to the table and break bread with our families, with our friends, with our community, whether they're vegan or not, invite them to your table a warm setting where you can break bread together and share warm conversation. And, and this, when we are a part of something, then we're bigger than ourselves. And this is how we can work on ourselves and change the world. So uh, that is really my interest, whatever it, however professionally I evolve in the future, it will have to be about somehow building community. Can I ask you an article on the Veg Economist about maybe we're not producing uh, the, it's not that we're failing in our products, that we're not producing the right products for the right audience. How do you segue that need for community into producing products that will appeal to somebody who is considering the change? Well, we do need products. I'm not in denial of that. I mean, because it does help people go vegan easier. I mean, I went vegan 40 years ago when there was nothing available and that was okay for me. But for a lot of people, it's just a lot easier to go into the store and buy something. Um, but the article that I wrote for Economist was just one little segment of a much larger picture. And it was, an, you know, Vegconomist is an economic newspaper. Uh, and therefore I had to write a business article and that mm -hmm. I was asked to write a business article. And I wanted to say, hey, we're not approaching this the right way. Making more burgers and nuggets will not save the world. But ultimately, I don't think it matters what products are sold. I mean, I do. I think that you have to have the right products for the right audience, which means you have to make the right products for early adopters. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the laggards and the late majority that are that uh, that we're making products for right now. We're not making the right products for the people that are interested in veganism right now. So that is something that we do have to switch. But that won't ultimately save animals until we as human beings come together as humanity and work together and have a sense of community and have a sense of and, and find joy in ourselves. I mean, I, one thing that I have to point out is there's a lot of lonely people in the world today and lonely people don't have the capacity. They don't have the extra love that they can give, but if they can be nurtured, they can also nurture. So we, we have to save animals, but we also have to save each other. And in doing so, we can save ourselves. You know, we forget um, that, it, that all animal problems are a people problem. Yes. That's a, that's a great reminder. One last question, and this is, uh, you inspire me. I know you inspire lots of people, um, not only because of your compassion, but because of your personal courage. You've gone through some tough times. And yet you seem to bounce back more active and more positive than ever. Do you have any words of advice or wisdom for people who are recovering from challenges, whether they're based in animal activism or everyday life? Well, I don't have any wisdom. <laughs> and um, I can say that, you know, I, I fall into just like everybody else. I fall into deep depression and yet mm -hmm. I have to show up in the world every single day. And I want to devote my life to somehow inspiring and helping others. And I, I want, it would be great if everybody could do that. I mean, it doesn't, you know, I, I get very, very depressed. I go through days of depression 
And then I have to get back up again. I have to pull myself back up and say, I have to show up in the world again and, and do something that will save animals, will create community. Um, I've had a lot of great people help me, people that have, I mean, the friends, you know, after everything I went through in the last year and a half, there's been an amazing community of people that have reached out to me, given me support, given me love. Um, and we all have to show up in the world for each other. Um, it's, you know, life isn't easy, but we have to remember that we are all on this. Why are we here? We're all going through our own evolution to become better human beings. That's what we have to remember. Well, you are certainly a great example of that, Miyoko. And sincerely, thank you so much. I do believe you're wise. Um, but you've given uh, us a lot to think about and a lot of fuel to move us all forward on our own journeys. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Miyoko. That was inspiring and well said, well said. We, we move now into a few minutes within this service of kind of exactly what Miyoko was talking about. Um, is that inner work, that work for ourselves. And and we do a blessings and prayers segment around here uh, so that we can, we can ventilate or we can ask for help if we need it uh, so that we can ask for, for prayers or blessings or whatever is your word in, in, your, in your tradition um, for the things that are on your mind, for the people that are on your mind, for the situations that are on your mind, uh, that we might bring peace, compassionate service, uh, and care for the earth community to those to those ideas. Uh, so Phil's going to open the chat up uh, so that you all are able to put uh, anything in there for for which you would like the blessings and prayers. Um, I have been thinking a lot about donkeys today uh, in the last week or so. Um, I was raised Presbyterian. Y'all have heard I'm a preacher kid. Uh, so, you know, I had a lot of influence from my, from my father and I spent a lot of time being stuck doing Christmas services, uh, and pretty much anything that my dad wanted me to do as a, as a little kid, fabulous guy, but you know what? I got a little old for those Christmas services and I got a little irritated that sometimes in some places they included live animals. Um, ours did not. Uh, but some churches nearby did have live nativity scenes. And I remember wishing that we had animals and at the same time being worried for those animals. It was very, very confusing as a child. And I was especially uh, fond of donkeys who got this bad rap at our church because we used the King James Bible. And so they were called asses. And every time they were called asses, all of the kids would giggle in the congregation. And I always thought that wasn't terribly, um, terribly reverent. So I am going to put one link in here for blessings and prayers today for ways to take actions for donkeys if you feel so called just like i did at the beginning of our service of ways to take action for reindeers um we have a blessing video today from one of our aspiring animal chaplains who's currently in our program she created this beautiful beautiful blessing for her homework uh, last month and when i spotted the rescue donkey uh, I was in. And so I asked Jeannie if she would come here uh, today and if we could share that uh, as a tribute to all the animals who aren't uh, faring well in nativity sets or at malls or parks this time of year where they're taken uh, for, for holiday reasons, animals who are in shelters, animals who are captive and in all sorts of different places. So if you could bring, I see Jeannie is up. Thank you, Phil. Um, so Jeannie Joseph is the creator of the ACT Resilient Method to help servicemen and women deal with extreme stress, PTSD, and related symptoms. For this work, she was given President Obama's Silver Volunteer Service Award. In addition, she's the founder of the Human Animal Connection, a nonprofit organization that brings people and therapy dogs together, oh, therapy animals, excuse me, together for the benefit of both. The program is free for veterans, active duty, first responders, healthcare providers, and anyone feeling stress in the line of duty. Through the program, therapeutic interactions with animals help humans relieve stress, restore resilience, increase their enthusiasm for life. The program has included over 4,000 service members, veterans, youth, elderly, and incarcerated people. So we're gonna play um, Jeannie's Blessing and then I will uh, take a little time attending to what you all have put in the chat. Jeannie, 
Hi. <laughs> Hi there. Thank you for sharing this with us. Um, would you like to give us just a moment or, or so about what inspired this practice for you? Well, I just want to say one thing about donkeys because they, they have been given a terrible rap, but they are so sensitive. They will only do what feels safe for them. And so they can teach us a lot about paying attention to where safety is in our body. So being with them is extraordinary. I mean, all animals are extraordinary, so I'm not trying to single them out in that way. But there is something very beautiful about being with donkeys because of their absolute presence. That's, I guess I'll, that's the way I would describe it. So I hope you'll have the opportunity to go be with a donkey sometime soon. Beautifully said. Thank you so much. Phil, if you could play the video for us. May we remember an animal blessing by Jeannie Joseph. May we breathe into our animal nature, remembering more fully with each breath. Who is breathing? Is it your breath or is it our breath we are sharing? You could take a deep breath or you could let your breath take you. Let it be as slow or as wide as it knows to be, surrounding you in a sweet sea of source, perfectly gathering awareness, perfect as it is, lovely awakening the sleeping tiger that is you. Remember a time when a loving creature was so close, you feel the soft rhythm of her breath on your skin. Like a time when a small white donkey rescued from careless hands met me for the first time, slowly inhaling me, discovering everything he needs to know about who I am. May we remember to allow our breath to lead us deeper into our animal nature. Breathe, weaving our true connection. And so it is. Thank you so much, Jeannie. And also offering prayers and blessings of beingness and awareness and of loveness and of compassion to uh, Jessica asks us for the squirrels, all the squirrels of the world, <laughs> shelter animals and workers, prayers for herself as she undergoes a medical procedure tomorrow. We will keep you in our minds, Jessica. And Judy asks for our elderly animals and all that comes with their aging. Amen. And the elderly human animals who are feeling their aging too, I will toss in there. Jeff asks for prayers for his rescue pup, Archie, who's in kidney failure. Prayers for Archie. May, uh, may he be comforted. May he feel, uh, feel the energy flow through him at this time. Debbie asks, Debbie and the Gang of Fur, uh, who is often here with us, asks for a prayer for all the innocent victims of human conflict, regardless of their species. Claire adds for turkeys and lambs and all animals eaten at the holiday season. Karen would like to extend our prayers for dollar who has transitioned, and for Lee, who loves him. And Nadia includes the old cat rescue that moved in with <laughs> that moved in with her last week to die in a safe place full of love. Patty asked for prayers for Minnie Motor and for Mark and Ruth for all the animals being dumped at shelters that they can find homes where they'll be cared for and love, and that they do not end up with a needle instead. Lots of love, Jeannie, for your blessing. And hello, future people. Whatever is on your mind right now as you're watching this, blessings and prayers for anything that is on your mind that is heavy or for any joys in your life uh, that may have happened or any wins uh, that might be going on that you might be part of or you might have read about. Uh, we have challenges and we have our joys as well. And finally, just to wrap up for Roseanne, for Roseanne's cat, Rue, who had multiple health issues and whom you had to say goodbye recently. May Rue's memory be a blessing. And we remember Bodie and Daisy for Susan. All of you, if you would help, uh, help me for this final blessing in prayer, Phil, if you could bring up our slide with the words that we say at the end of every one of our Sunday services. And if you all would 
Feel comfortable sharing this in your mind or out loud, depending on where you are. May all creatures everywhere be happy and free. May the thoughts, words, and actions of our lives contribute to this happiness and this freedom for all. May it be so. Amen. I mean, so mote it be. Om shanti, shanti, shanti. And I'll add for Jeannie, and so it is, whatever your closing word is. And thank you all for coming to Sunday service for the main act. And now we have some announcements and then we'll head into fellowship. <laughs> Gentleman William, will you please tell us what's coming up? There are some cool things coming up it's, in January. Yeah, there's very cool things happening in, in January. So um, thank you for joining us. And on January 21st, um, our spiritual guest, will be Dr. Salish Rao. And Dr. Rao has over three decades of professional experience and is the founder and executive director of Climate Healers, a nonprofit dedicated towards healing the Earth's climate. For Dr. Rao, the word vegan means vitally engaged guardians of animals and nature. And Dr. Rao believes it's critically important to consider a fundamental rethinking of our relationship with animals and nature in a post-pandemic world while simultaneously addressing our environmental problems holistically. So then, um, our Compassion in Action um, guest on January 21 will be Phil DeJong. And you all know Phil. Um, he's a Zoom tech for both the Compassion Consortium and Main Street Vegan Academy. Phil is a co-founder of Plant Powered Disruptors, an NYC-based group that challenged the status quo to create a more compassionate world through creative social events and arts imbued activism. Yeah, Phil is a, an art, artist himself and a high school art teacher. He has been a vegan for 11 years, maintains a 100 pound weight loss and has hosted the Checkerboard Kids TV show on Manhattan Neighborhood Network since 1992. So on December 9th, our Compassion Consortium for our engaged members will be led by Victoria, and she her reflection will be called Crafting Your Vision 2024. Then lastly, on January 24th at 7.30 p.m., our Compassion Consortium film night and discussion uh, will be held. We we haven't had any of these for a while, but we're going to start having a film night and, and um, book night uh, every every quarter. And the first one is Vegan U Vegan Uary's celebration of its tenth anniversary, as we look back at the past decade and reflect on the triumphs and challenges over the years. We will view Vegan Vignuary's 22-minute documentary as our guests from Vignuary explore Vignuary's impact and expansion around the world since launching in 2013. And there'll be a Q&A following the documentary. That is what's coming up in um, January, and we hope that you can join us.